It's the age of tyranny, the end of the Republic, a time of treachery, and the beginning of an empire. This is the reign of Julius Caesar, Rome's greatest general, both hero and villain. He expands a kingdom and launches a bloody civil war. Ruthless rivals spin a deadly plot against him. New research reveals how his own actions bring him closer to death. And a long simmering conspiracy seals his fate. The Republic of Rome has survived for 400 years. It's an empire without an emperor, ruled by elected officials and written laws. The Senate is at the very top of society, an elite class of men, all equal, all desperately competing for fame and glory. Their ambition is the force that fuels the state. The Romans understand what a powerful incentive individual achievement and reward can be. And Rome's greatness depends on giving great men incentive to do great deeds. To win honor and prestige, they expand the empire and build the city, risking that one day, one person may become too powerful. It's a very difficult balancing act. And the Romans pull it off for centuries to their great credit, but it begins to fall apart. By 44 BC, Julius Caesar is the greatest of these men. He pushes all the ideals that the Republic has always encouraged to absolute extremes. But his actions will bring the Republic to its knees. Caesar recognizes that he's living in an age in which the old rules are about to change. And so he is willing to take a series of steps that will lead to civil war, that will shake the system, that will cost him his life. No one is left to challenge him. He maneuvers, claws, and kills his way to the top, becoming dictator and the most powerful man in Rome. For that reason alone, Caesar is a marked man. There are those who will do anything to stop him. They are conspiring together very carefully. This whole event has to be really well choreographed, yet it ends in complete savagery. He dies, stabbed 23 times on the floor of the Senate meeting house. The journey to this day, the 15th, or Ides of March, began 450 years earlier. Then, too, the aristocracy united to exile a dictator, its own king, and the Roman Republic was born. The final king is a tyrant, and he is expelled. And from the point of his expulsion, the Romans are utterly determined that never again will they be ruled by one man. Their word for king, Rex, becomes an object of the most passionate hatred. The revolt is celebrated throughout the Republic, and its leader becomes a legend. His name is carried proudly by his descendants. Brutus, one of Caesar's closest friends, is among them. He is an immensely important person. Brutus is a symbol of the very nature, the very foundation, the origin of the Republican Republican institutions. Romans place enormous value on history, tradition, and family. Self-appointed guardians are the heads of ancient clans. These are the men who really run the city. This is the house of the Griffins. Back in Caesar's day, one of the most powerful men in Rome would live here. And if you were let into a room like this, you would be doing your deals, you would be negotiating with the master of the house in incredibly lavish setting. 
It was here you'd come to ask for favours. You'd ask for a loan, you'd ask for assistance. In return, you gave honour to the man who lived here. In private meetings in luxurious surroundings like this, the future of the Republic was stitched up. It's a ruthless world where violence is just another political tool. Perhaps it makes sense to think of aristocratic factions in the Republic as operating almost like mafia families. Those who are awarded power by the Republican system of government have the opportunity to win legions and wealth and backing for themselves beyond the wildest dreams or indeed nightmares of the original founders of the state. Between them, they allocate political appointments, trade concessions, and military commands. But just as the Mafia operate within rules, so also do the Roman aristocracy. Ideally, the way it's supposed to be in the Roman Republic is that no one man is supposed to outshine any of the others. There's this is constant tension in Roman history. Got to encourage great men to do great things, but pull back because you don't want him going too far. Forty years before Caesar's time, the Romans lived through a failed system, a vicious dictatorship. A general by the name of Sulla had seized power. Sulla wins a, a terrible, bloody civil war, and he posts the names in public of senators who are going to be killed and whose property is going to be confiscated or sold for a song. That's the world in which Caesar grew up. Young Caesar was stripped of his wealth and forced to flee. Sulla, with a sort of gracious wave of the hand, finally decided to pardon him. Sulla, who was ambitious, a gambler, probably saw in Caesar someone rather like himself. It's certainly said that even as he pardoned Caesar, he gave warning that this young man was very, very dangerous. Sulla was perhaps the first to study Caesar and note his potential. 20 centuries since then, countless others have tried to understand him, to build a picture of a man whose extraordinary actions are well recorded, but whose motives can be difficult to grasp. A remarkable find may finally bring us closer. The city of Arles, southern France, Established by Caesar as a colony for the most trusted veterans of his military campaigns, this amphitheater is one of the largest and best preserved outside Rome. In the nearby riverbed of the Rhone, archaeologists have pulled hundreds of artifacts. A key discovery is made in 2007. From its location and its resemblance to certain first century coins, some historians believe this very lifelike sculpture is a portrait of Caesar. You can see some of the characteristics. You've got the heavy furrows on the brow, the chin, the Adam's apple and the, the creases on the neck. All of these are very familiar from Caesar's coins. If it is Caesar, it's not like any other image of him. Almost all the others are thought to be produced after his death. They're romanticized. He's more god than man. But this could have been drawn from life. The Romans of this period don't represent themselves as particularly handsome or impressive looking human beings. But they do emphasize maturity, age, distinction. These were people you could trust to run the state. But the problem is, if you look at a bust like this, it's rather lifeless. It's very hard to get inside the mind of that person. And this was a big problem for people at the time. They were worried about Caesar. They didn't know what he planned in the long term. If this is the face of Caesar, then we know what he looked like. We also know what he did, because he wrote his own account. He conquers the entire nation of Gaul, the whole of modern France. Roman historians say he fought more battles than anyone else. The people of Rome give him more honors 
more titles, and more power than anyone else in their history. But they will still cut him down. A pattern begins to emerge in the career of Julius Caesar. With every triumph and every success, he takes a step closer to death. He becomes a threat to the Republic and a danger to himself, simply by succeeding. What's striking, I think, about Caesar is the fact that everything that Caesar does, he is good at. Early on, Caesar follows a very traditional path. He masters one skill essential in public life, speaking to the crowd. He is a formidable orator. He performs in the law courts. He obtains magistracies. Almost everything he turns his hand to turns to gold. Legal cases are heard at the Forum, Rome's center of public activity. Here, in the open air, people first see Caesar perform. He has a famous family name, but no inherited wealth. Instead, he deploys the weapons he does have, his quick wit, and most of all, his charm. This is Caesar's rostra. If it looks like a stage, there's a very good reason for that. This high platform was where Roman orators addressed the crowded assemblies of the Roman people. Public life in Rome was just that, public. When Julius Caesar appeared in a law court as an advocate, the trial occurred over there, on a raised platform in the middle of the forum. Anyone passing by could stop and could listen, could pay attention. And that was what Caesar hoped for. He had to make the crowd stop. He wanted people to notice him. The outcome of the trial didn't matter half as much as Caesar's fame. One thing that's very clear about Caesar is that he wanted to be grander than his moment, uh, bigger than mortal, um, that he was doing what he did for posterity. Caesar repeatedly turns adversity to advantage. He wins a minor public office and is required to fund gladiator games out of his own pocket. Though he has no money, he manages to stage the most lavish games ever. He runs up massive debts, but banks on making political gains. Popularity means high office, and high office pays. His growing fan base is an investment. He is like the owner of a football team who is willing to splash any amount of money to buy the most expensive players and to really rub it in the face of opposing fans. Caesar appeals directly to the public. The old regime finds it disturbing. His enemies in the Senate, who are well aware of what he's up to, are forced to rush through legislation trying to limit the amount of money that can be spent on gladiators. The Senate should be apprehensive. The gladiator games of 65 BC create a close bond between Caesar and the common people that will never be broken. And Caesar has momentum. In a surprising move, he now targets one of the great offices of state, Pontifex Maximus, the head priest. Traditionally a job for a senior senator, it controls one of Rome's most revered institutions, the Temple of Vesta. Here, the Vestal Virgins guard a sacred flame, the symbol of Rome itself, a flame that is believed to protect Rome for as long as it burns. As head priest, Caesar will be at the center of the Roman establishment. Many see it as a ceremonial role, but he sees its political value. New excavations are taking place at the Temple of Vesta. This is one of the holiest places in ancient Rome. This building served as the residence for the priestesses who were obliged to uh, do 24-7 service uh, in the temple, alternating. And therefore, this is the place where they lived. 
While the Vestal Virgins commit to 30 years of service, the job of head priest is held for life. The cult of Vesta represents the, in effect, survival of the community. It is the people's welfare that is at stake. So there is a great deal uh, of political capital in being able to secure that office. The head priest is also elected by the people of Rome. So Caesar only needs to win their support. Once again, he borrows a vast fortune, then sets out to buy the vote. As Caesar left his house on the morning of the election, he turned to his mother and told her that he'd either return as a victor or he wouldn't come home at all. Failure to win would leave him with debts he'll never be able to repay. And he would be stripped of his rank as senator. But Caesar proves to be a fearless gambler, a trait he'll display throughout his career. He'd spent his money well. He won election to the post of Pontifex Maximus. For the rest of his life, he was Rome's senior priest. He also got to live in the Domus Publica. That's right down there. It's in the center of the forum. Caesar was physically and politically at the very heart of things. It was another step up the political ladder. Out of nowhere, he obtains the permanent position as head of state religion. And now, the establishment sees who it's really dealing with. Caesar is not prepared to wait for power. He uses the government, but does not respect it. Caesar makes it clear that he has contempt for the old order, that he's not willing to play by the rules, that he's willing to impose his own rules, and that he has a genius and a talent, an ability to speak to the people and manipulate the system that make a lot of people very, very nervous. Caesar has arrived, and no one can ignore him. Neither can they see the threat he will become. In Rome, politics is vicious and unforgiving. Based on secret deals and sudden betrayals, decisions that determine the future of the empire are made behind closed doors. This is where Caesar makes his name. There was already a shadow government that was really running Rome. Some of the city's godfathers spot his talent early on. They have bankrolled his political campaigns. One of the reasons that Caesar is successful in his career is because he is able to prove useful to cynical men who want to use the Republic for their own purposes. But now, with enormous support and a growing reputation, he has something of his own to bargain with. He plans to run for consul, the most senior office of state, and forges a pact with Rome's two most powerful men. In that political alliance, Caesar was very much the junior man. Caesar was a man who had extraordinary talents, but not nearly the, uh, the wealth or the reputation of the two older men. First, there's Crassus. In a rich city, he is the richest of all. The senator once declared, no man may account himself rich unless he can fund his own army. He owns dozens of city blocks, is a slum landlord, and runs his own fire department. Crassus buys burning buildings at knockdown prices. Now he's the third partner in a deal between Julius Caesar and Pompey the Great. Before Caesar, Pompey was the most popular and successful general in Rome's history. Anyone who was going to succeed would have to model themselves and emulate Pompey. And I think Pompey not only changed Roman politics, but also must have changed what Caesar thought of himself. Whatever Pompey can do, I can do. Before Caesar, Pompey dominated Rome's enemies, her Senate, even her skyline. Pompey's theater was a vast structure rising above the city. Most of it is now buried under modern buildings. But a 3D map based on new research tells an extraordinary story. 
Architecture speaks volumes. Buildings make, make statements. Bobby built his building to last and to ensure that his reputation lasted with it. And in that regard, he was uh, very successful. Some six centuries after Pompey's death, his theater was still being used, was still associated with his name and his glory. Built with the spoils of war as a gift for the people, it holds an audience of 40,000, every one of them in Pompey's debt, every one of them reminded of his greatness. This theater is Roman politics written in stone. It also had a curia, a senate house, a place where the ruling people of Republican Rome could come together for a meeting, but do so almost literally in the shadow of, uh, of Pompey and Pompey's monument. This is where Caesar will die, long after both Pompey and Crassus meet their own violent ends. These men have fought their entire lives. They are uneasy allies who join forces to divide the Roman state. Crassus represents business interests in the East and wants laws passed in their favor. Pompey brings brute strength his legions, and wants land and reward for his soldiers. Even the very greatest figure in Rome, even a Pompey the Great, has to secure backing across the Senate and beyond. And to do that, he needs magistrates who are able to provide him with votes. That is where Caesar comes in. If he wins the consulship, Caesar can give them what they want. He'll have power, and at the end of his term, a rich province to govern. The deal is made. After 400 years of proud Republican history, the power now rests with three men. And Caesar does exactly what he sets out to do for his colleagues. But also, of course, he secures for himself um, the entitlement to a province in the north of Italy, bordering Gaul, which will then enable him to secure the kind of military glory that Pompey has already won. Caesar serves a year as consul, then heads out to govern his province. What he does in Gaul, modern-day France, will become the stuff of legend. Gaul was part of the Roman province of Transalpine Gaul, and when Caesar arrived here, that was threatened by migrating Gallic tribes, who, if they weren't stopped, could end up threatening Rome and Italy itself. Whether the threat to Rome is real or imagined, Caesar needs no encouragement to plan his conquest. He defeats 300 tribes, destroys 800 cities, and kills one million people, and still claims that he's acting only in Rome's interests. Caesar presented his campaigns as very much in the interests of Rome's republic. War after war was fought to defend the interests of Rome's allies. Above all, the Gallic Wars reveal Caesar as a military genius, capable of leading his troops to victory after victory. Most of what we know comes from Caesar's own accounts, propaganda written for the Roman people. But the facts speak for themselves. One battle in particular shows what a formidable enemy Julius Caesar was. The campaign had been going badly for Caesar, and he began to retreat down here to Provence. He's being pursued by a large army. The Gaulish tribes have united under one leader, Vercingetorix. Then he won a minor skirmish when Vercingetorix's cavalry attacked his column. Caesar immediately turned round, pursued the Gauls, and went for the jugular. Caesar and his three legions pursue Vercingetorix's forces to the hilltop citadel of Alessia. Caesar marched to the city and immediately began work surrounding it with a line of fortifications. The scale of Caesar's ambition, his vision, his ability to motivate his men, can all be seen in what he orders them to build. It's a loop around the city. There are watchtowers and man traps, 12 foot high ramparts, and two deep ditches, 15 feet wide and 15 feet deep. 15,000 of Caesar's men build it all in just three weeks.
Vercingetorix had sent for help. Messengers went to all the tribes throughout Gaul. They raised an army which Caesar claims consisted of a quarter of a million men. So Caesar set his men building a second line of fortifications. The first had faced inwards towards the city. The second faced outwards. He and his troops have walled themselves in. They are outnumbered five to one. There is no escape. It's victory or death. The siege lasts nearly two months, but Caesar eventually defeats Vercingetorix and leaves thousands dead. Alessia marks the end of the resistance to the Roman conquest of Gaul. The impact of Caesar on Gaul was obviously staggeringly violent. For eight years, his legions marched up and down. They killed hundreds of thousands of people. They enslaved a million more. Caesar increases the size of the empire by almost a third. His achievements rival Pompey's. Slavery, plunder, and taxation all reap enormous rewards and make him richer than Crassus. He also acquired glory. He became the most famous commander of the Roman Republic. Caesar has always been a consummate politician and major public figure. But more than that, eight years of warfare have turned him into a man that other men will follow anywhere. He had an army of fanatically loyal soldiers, loyal more to Caesar himself than they were to the Roman state. When it came to the crunch and civil war loomed, these men would fight for Caesar and not for the Republic. As a general, as a statesman, in terms of pure wealth, Caesar's achievements are unprecedented. It's hard to know what he will do next, what might satisfy him, or what might stop him. Rome will soon be hit by a power struggle which will determine the course of history. It will be fought by huge armies across the empire, but begins as a personal rivalry. The political elite were very close-knit. They were endlessly marrying, divorcing, adopting one another, um, and so they, were, they would all have known one another. Um, that didn't necessarily lead to uh, better relations. Often the very fact that they knew each other meant that they loathed each other all the more. Crassus is now dead. Caesar and Pompey divide power between them. It seems appalling that the fate of 50 million people around the Mediterranean and in, into Northern Europe should be in the hands of so few. But they balance each other. Neither can grow too strong while the other still stands. This alliance between two massive egos is never going to last. Pompey's junior partner is about to outstrip the master. He's going to change the balance. This drives Pompey, of course, crazy. So in 52 BC, Pompey and his faction strike first by using the law. The Senate relieves Caesar of his command as general in the field and demands that he return to Rome. Clearly, it's something he will never do. And so he feels he has nothing to lose. He brings his legions up to the border of the small river that marks the limit of his province. For Caesar, it's a question of honor. He cannot surrender, and his men will follow him anywhere. Now, no Roman general can cross into Italy with their army without it being a declaration of war against the state. Caesar does it anyway, and Rome is now engaged in civil war. So although Pompey and Caesar are cast as opposites, antagonists, they were two of a kind. They were like two scorpions in a bottle, locked in a malign and destructive relationship. The rivalry recruits over 50,000 troops who battle their way across Roman territories in Italy, France, and Spain. Pompey's forces are annihilated at Pharsalus in Greece. While seeking asylum with the pharaoh in Alexandria, Pompey, the great general, 
is murdered. When Caesar returns to Rome after being absent for over four years, there is no one left to oppose him. He promises a new era of peace and stability. The battles are over. He receives every honor that the Roman Republic can legitimately give him. But the Senate appoints him to an office, which in the past was reserved only for times of dire emergency. His new title is Dictator. That really was the tipping point. That was the moment at which I think it became inevitable that he was going to be assassinated. There's no telling what he'll do next. Slowly, the people begin to realize the level of Caesar's ambitions. He may want the one thing that all of Rome forbids and fears. This man has the ability to become the king of Rome. To make himself king would be to kill the Republic. To strike at the fundamental ideas which make Rome great. And yet the danger of a monarchy is that it is attractive to some. An image of one strong man leading his country forward to new greatness. After all, this is a city addicted to glory and takes its name from its founder, its first king, Romulus. The Romans said that their city was founded in the 8th century BC. Tradition has it that the twins, Romulus and Remus, were abandoned in a crib that washed ashore on the Tiber River. It's said that the twins are rescued by a she-wolf, a lupa, and she raises them in her cave, the Lupercal. Today, a chance find made by archaeologists on the Palatine Hill suggests that even after 400 years of the Republic, this myth was still alive. Cristiano Russo that was working on the project has uh, drilled in, uh, exactly in this point. Ah, right. And uh, you can imagine the surprise okay. when he, he found uh, at a certain moment a cavity, yeah. uh, uh, empty space. So he introduced the, the video camera. The camera found a richly decorated cave. The mosaics on its walls date to around the time of Caesar. And on the basis of its location, some scholars believe that this place was once venerated as the Lupercal. Yeah, uh, so the myth could fit. It all makes sense, yes, even yes. whether true or not. And to confirm that, uh, it is very important for, mm. for the history, for all the history of Rome. So clearly, in Caesar's time, even though the Romans have thrown out their kings, the idea still fascinates them. There is an annual festival called the Lupercalia, which brings the city to a standstill. In 44 BC, Caesar uses it to make his move. Everything about the festival of the Lupercalia is, is mysterious. And it may be that the fact that this celebration goes right back to the monarchical origins of Rome were felt by Caesar to be an appropriate time to test the waters to find out whether just conceivably, just possibly, the Roman people would allow him to become king. Caesar has Mark Antony, his loyal lieutenant, offer him the ultimate symbol of kingship, a crown. The crowd didn't like that. There were silence murmurs. Caesar pushed it away and the crowd cheered. But Mark Antony took it up again and again offered the crown to Caesar. He has badly misjudged the mood of the people. He now has to backtrack and turn a coronation into a show of modesty. Caesar refused for the second time, and this time the crowd went wild. They cheered, they applauded. Caesar even said that he'd cut his own throat if it would please them. It is impossible to know what would have happened if the crowd had responded differently. And though he saves face, few people are now in any doubt. Caesar actually did think he deserved to be a king. Success had gone to this guy's head. He can't hide what he really thinks. And what he really thinks is, I am the greatest. For some, this is the moment they have waited for. Caesar has set himself on an unfavorable course and must be stopped. He's too strong to defeat politically. 
He has to die. Soon after, Mark Antony offers a crown to Caesar. A core group in the Senate begins to plot his fate. Many are veterans of Pompey's armies, defeated by Caesar in the Civil War. They call themselves the Liberators and believe it's their destiny to save the Republic from tyranny. Every one of them comes from the upper tier of Roman society, the old network of ruling families. The group's leader is Brutus. His relationship with Caesar is particularly complex. His mother had been Caesar's mistress, and so Caesar was connected to his family in a way that was not entirely appealing to Brutus. And Brutus had been an opponent of Caesar. Brutus originally had fought against Caesar in the Civil War. Caesar adopts a deliberate policy of clemency towards those who fought against him. Not only did he spare their lives, he publicly pardoned them. The Romans looked at Caesar's clemency and it disgusted them. They had contempt for it and contempt for themselves that they accepted that clemency. And I think that psychologically, that is one of the things driving the conspirator. They hate Caesar because he was kind to them. These men live by a simple moral code. In war, they seek victory or death. By beating them, then pardoning them, Caesar robs them of not only power, but of honor. There's only one way to get these back. For Brutus, it's clear. One of the founding myths of the Roman Republic was that it was born out of the expulsion of the kings from Rome. Brutus was a descendant of that first Brutus who expelled the kings, who gave birth to the Republic. So that pressure of the past is very strongly um, in the minds of the conspirators. The pace of events suddenly picks up. It's announced that Caesar will soon lead his legions on a campaign abroad. He'll be leaving the city for at least three years. The plotters must act quickly. They agree on the 15th of the month, the Ides of March, when the Senate will next be in session. It starts with senators coming to Caesar's house to form a nice procession to escort him to the Senate. And what are we to make of the fact that the sources say that Caesar was warned to beware the Ides of March, but he's contemptuous of it. He holds himself above it. Word of the plot spreads, but Caesar ignores all warnings. He doesn't credit his enemies with the strength or the courage to strike. He even travels through Rome without a bodyguard. Only Mark Antony accompanies him. And the plotters contrive to separate the two. Antony is distracted as Caesar goes to the Senate. On this day, ironically, they gather in the Curia, or meeting house, of Pompey's theater. The conspirators decide to assassinate Julius Caesar in the Curia. It's very deliberate because this is a public space. This is a very powerful statement. The liberators are terrified that their plot might be exposed. They wait anxiously, their daggers hidden beneath their clothes. Caesar enters the Curia and takes his place on his gilded throne. First, one senator approaches and pleads that his exiled brother be allowed to come home. The plan assumes, correctly, that Caesar will refuse. That seems to have been a quite deliberate move, an expectation that Caesar's going to say no. And in saying no, he can be yet again in that gesture revealed as tyrant. The pleading senator grabs at Caesar's robes. That is the signal. The first blow hits him on the neck. Then all the conspirators step in to strike. It's a confused attack. So violent are the stabbings that the conspirators were apparently even stabbing each other in their efforts to get at Caesar's body. And it's described as being like um, uh, the hunting down of a, of a beast. The last blow is struck by Brutus. 
Caesar's one-time friend. And at that point, he gives up his attempt to survive. Confusion and chaos in the Senate House. The senators clear out of the building, and what's left behind is the body of Julius Caesar, ironically, at the foot of the statue of Pompey the Great. They go rushing out into the streets, announcing that the, the tyrant is dead, that liberty has been restored. And the reaction of ordinary people is one of absolute terror. They all run to their homes and bolt their doors. Caesar was a hero to the people, and now he is dead. The so-called liberators have completely misread the situation. They thought they were rescuing Rome, but they plunged it into chaos. With Caesar dead, his killers believe that the old republic will be restored. All the power that Caesar gathered for himself will revert to the heads of Rome's leading families. This will be their reward for ridding the city of a tyrant. They thought that there was wide support in Rome for the idea that a would-be king should be put down. It's clear that they lack Caesar's feel for the mood of the people and that they were wrong and Caesar was right. What happens is that there is tremendous support, not for the liberators, but for Caesar and his heirs. The funeral takes place in the Forum, three days after Caesar's death. His nephew Octavian is revealed as the heir to his estate. He now joins forces with Mark Antony. Caesar's heirs work very hard to reconstruct the view of the conspiracy as not an assassination undertaken for the greater good of the state, for the benefit of the people, for the, for the freedom of Rome, but as murder, as murder of a friend. The populace rise up. They riot against the liberators and they burn down their houses. What follows is another civil war, and this time, Brutus and his friends are shown no mercy. Octavian doesn't merely avenge Caesar's death. He actively encourages the cult that emerges. People start to worship the murdered Caesar. Within months, people had set up altars to him. Within a year, he was formally declared a god. Now, Caesar himself probably wouldn't have cared too much about that. He was only ever worried about immediate political gain and what posterity thought didn't really matter. But he would have approved of the way his adopted son, Octavian, turned himself into the son of the divine Julius and would fight his way to power and become Rome's first emperor. This was perhaps Octavian's greatest tribute, completing the job that Caesar began. In 27 BC, he is crowned emperor and becomes Caesar Augustus. He begins his reign, takes on the name of Caesar, son of Caesar, uh, at the beginning in order to ensure the loyalty of Caesar's uh, troops. Ultimately, all that has happened is you kill Caesar and now you get another. The success of the Roman Republic is built on the actions of great men. Though its citizens live in constant fear that too much power would corrupt one man. This is the paradox at the heart of the city-state, and Caesar never finds a way to resolve it. He can't see beyond the opposite poles of republic and monarchy. But Octavian finds a third way. He negotiates for himself the title Princeps, first citizen of Rome. He becomes more powerful than any king. And the greatest irony of all is that Octavian manages to create an imperial monarchy, to create, if you like, a tyranny far greater than anything that Caesar seemed to have been attempting. To the men in the Senate who kill Caesar, their actions, the murder of a friend and colleague, must have seemed radical, even revolutionary. They believe that the blood of a tyrant would renew their ancient republic. but they are wrong. The plot to assassinate Caesar was too little, too late. It was doomed to fail. 
the scale of the crisis that had engulfed the Republic was simply too great to be erased by the assassination even of Caesar. Caesar, the name, has a potency that will endure long after Rome itself has fallen. Indeed, even into the 20th century, there were rulers who were proud to wear it as their own personal title. That is quite some legacy. Caesar's dream of becoming king dies with him on the Ides of March. But paving the way for his heir and successor, Caesar Augustus, to become Rome's first emperor, he establishes a dynasty and an imperial system that lasted 400 years and a civilization that transforms the world. This was arguably Caesar's greatest achievement.